Hey everybody, well done. FlowerArtTech10.com, and here we are at the uh, Andy Warhol show in Tate Modern. And uh, this is the crazy photo of the silver clouds, silver floating pillow room, which is pretty funky, isn't it? Anyway, so let's stroll through this as it's kind of cool and fun. There's the people having to constantly push them back into it. And let's stroll through here, down back to the uh, first room. So, it's quite a big exhibition, um, but actually looks pretty cool with all the different stuff they've got here. And you can see some of the nice bits as we stroll through it quickly. Um, so obviously, I'm sure you know Andy Wall's a pop artist as they would say, but anyway, let's go and have a look in this first room. So there's a funky picture of him, sort of self-portrait of himself. So if you didn't know, he was uh, actually called Andy Warhol and came from, uh, uh, where was it, Slovakia. He grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and look at these, these are, he was very, very good at drawing as well, which you don't often realize, but you have a look at some of these lovely drawings. Mm -hmm. Look at these cracking little faces, very simply drawn and done. Really cool. Look at that scarf. Scarf's good, isn't it? And down here, these heads. And the head with the flowers, that's nice. Yes, you've got loads of nice, really quality drawing things. Obviously, he was gay. Um, at the time when sex between men was illegal in the US, but he embraced his New York queer community of designers, poets and dancers. That was after he'd obviously left um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which obviously I think he was desperate to get out of. If you know those Lou Reed songs about him, it was like growing up in a small town and stuff like that. He couldn't bear it, he just wanted to get out, go to the city. And this must be one of his films called Sleep. So he did also do these films. This one's called Sleep, which I think lasts about eight hours of somebody sleeping. This is the first serious art film made over several nights in the summer and autumn 1963. Shows 22 close-ups of poet John Giorno, who is briefly Warhol's lover as he sleeps in the nude. <laughs> Warhol was fascinated by the ability of his friends to stay up for days on end while using drugs and wondered whether sleep would soon become obsolete. <laughs> there you go. squeeze back out of there and see what else is going on. Um, so he was a commercial artist for quite a long time. There doesn't seem to be much about that here. I hear it does say, yes, it says it. Although he was a successful illustrator, Warhol still wanted to be taken seriously as an artist. Inspired by the new wave of art he saw in New York galleries in 1960, he started making hand-painted pictures, combining advertising imagery with expressive painting. It soon gave way to a clean graphic style now known as pop art. Claims he grew up eating watered down ketchup with salt for soup. So that could explain why he did his Warhol soup cans. But then you've got some pretty funky ones in here. So you've got, um, let's have a look. So you've got these two faces before and after. And then here you've got 199 dollar television. I would have said that was one of the still quite early pop party ones, this one. He hasn't really got that clean and crisp style. He's still sort of juggling himself towards it. But then by the time you get to this Coke can, this Coke bottles rather, he's kind of got his, um, he's got his vibe on more efficiently. I mean, he's got, he knows what he's going to do. And then particularly by the time you get to these Campbell's soup cans, this is a really sort of his classic thing. Taking everyday objects and making them art. Really kind of funky simple idea but very hard to have come up with and the same thing with the brillo soap pads and the exhibition's moving quite quickly out of that into um, stuff that you could say is more obsessed with death so it's got people dying in a jet and you got these classic ones of like elvis presley which is really cool isn't it lovely red and blue and sort of violet trousers but then you've got the misty bit of him there which you could say was him sort of dying or you know 
this uh, image not repeating. You got this woman falling out of a um, window. So there were quite a lot of these ones that are more death obsessed at this point. I can't remember what this is. This is a police race riot. Red race riot. Royal Hall used three photos of a police dog attacking an African American man. So I suppose he was, he was kind of, I don't know, he said he was political, even though that was flowers, a much more simple one here. I don't really remember one striking these flowers. Royal Hall defined the gravity of the Death and Disaster series with the Bright and Charlotte Flower series. Oh, okay, so that was Death and Disaster we're looking about there. This example features fluorescent paint. Unlike Death and Disaster, the sound flowers sold very well. Why well, is a surprise? While well, they were painted at a time of flower power, I think also a little bit more cheery. This must be another Death and Disaster one, where there's somebody trapped under a car. And then you've got good old Marlon Brando lurking on his motorbike from that film. And then over here, of course, we've got this classic Marilyn Monroe one. That's really good, isn't it? It's interesting how you look at it. You can actually see that Marilyn Monroe changes a little bit in every single image. Her teeth and her lips and her eyebrows, so they're not just cleanly reprinted. They must be screen prints, but they change a little bit every time. And these are these fascinating ones of, it must be Jackie Kennedy. I much prefer them when they're blue. They're all sort of brown here, but there's some really good blue ones I've seen. Now let's keep moving on. So we're going into a more kind of Silver face. I think this is probably talking more about the factory here. Yeah. Factory. This is like an experimental art studio in space, social space. Warhol set up the first factory in '63. After seeing his collaborator and former lover Billy Names apartment, he asked him to cover the factory with silver paint and foil. It was a setting for the mass production of his paintings and sculptures and the site of Warhol's new interest in underground filmmaking. So, obviously, you've got a Lee Reed here. He was in the Velvet Underground. He was the band. Uh, uh, Warhol sort of supported you know, Eddie Sedgwick, Paul Jasmine, and Gino Pisecchi. I don't know so much about them. And then you got Eddie Sedgwick and Ingrid Superstar still here as well. But obviously. And then around here, you got something a bit different because some of these silver colours have escaped. And you just got the. Oh, this must have been one of those sort of portrait things where you just filmed people sitting there. Which is kind of funky, I don't know who that's meant to be, but they are just being filmed, staring at him. Quite interesting way to do a portrait. And then of course you've got a uh, Elizabeth Taylor portrait flung in there as well. <laughs> oh, I think there's quite a lot of different faces on these things that will rotate. But um, I'm not sure which one that actually is. And then we're going to come back into this crazy silver pillow room where now people go mad and are bashing them around. <laughs> Which is uh, entertaining for everybody, isn't it? And then, let's move through here. Now you can hear the Velvet Underground playing, or I, yeah, I suppose this was the exploding plastic inevitable. Which I think was, you know, working with members of the factory wall became interested in combining film with performance and music. So I think he would have the films and then he'd have the Velvet Underground playing the music. So I think this is some films of what it would have kind of looked like, I think. Um, so I'm not quite sure. I mean, maybe this is what it would have looked like. I'm not trying to recreate the vibe of it. But um, anyway, you get a sense of what's happening, don't you? So they're sort of freaking out, bashing stuff on the ground. So you can see the scars from when he was shot. 
a shot by company of somebody called Valerie Solanas. Don't quite know what, why or how. Sorry, what was going on? But um, I think she was somebody who'd been at the factory who felt a bit spurned or upset and shot him, but it did kind of put an end to the whole of this sort of special social area. Um, and then after the shooting, he does eventually get back to work. Oh, this is cool, isn't it? With those purple heads on the wall, and then the guy there. And he's still got these death skulls, so he's still into that whole death thing. And then he's got a big, like, sort of Soviet hammer and sickle. It's really big, in fact. But, um... So, yeah, so he's got back to it anyway. And he seemed to have an interview magazine, doesn't he? I'm not quite sure. After the shooting, Warhol passed much of his directing on to Paul Morrison, who had worked on Warhol's films since The Chelsea Girls. His business manager, Fred Hughes, sourced new portrait commissions from wealthy clients. This helped fund Interview Magazine, edited by college graduate Bob Colaccio and ideas for TV shows produced by Vincent Fremont. Warhol's studio turned from an open social space to one focused on what he called business art. Warhol explained that making money is art and working is art and because business is the best art. Yeah, so he always had that sort of like, business inside to him. Now, here we go, it's the nine. This is a uh, ladies and gentlemen. Produced a new series featuring anonymous black and Latinx drag queens and trans women. And an art dealer came up, I don't really know about this one uh, well, actually. The title implies um, Simo is less concerned with the lived experience of the models and more interested in the dramatization of gender. The subjects were recruited by Warhol's friends and from local drag bars and posed for a fee. Warhol took over 500 photographs of 14 models. The selection of these were enlarged onto silk screens. The result was a large group of paintings that deviate from the original composer in favour of an expression of performance, glamour and personality. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, there's little ones, that's quite interesting. You don't often get to see little. Warhol's is actually pretty cool. They're all quite nice, even though they're quite small. They're really funky. Hmm. <laughs> really cool. <clever. laughs> nice. And if you look at her, you got some bigger ones there, some of the other smaller ones on the side. Nice, not bad at all. <laughs> yeah, especially those little ones. And they come in here, you got more sort of pop star stuff. So you've got like Debbie Harry, Mick Jagger. So, uh, you know, all those kind of people. I don't know if he did these as commissions or... Oh, as it says here, by this time he was an international celebrity himself. He was photographed and took photographs of places such as the nightclub Studio 54, alongside public figures such as Grace Jones and Debbie Harry. He famous went out every night in a condition referred to as social disease. As well as giving his work publicity, his exposure enabled him to reinforce his distinctive public identity. Some critics dismissed his socialising and lucrative business of producing commissioned portraits for the powerful and rich and selling out. Okay, so maybe he was literally making these for the rich people, but I don't know. Not necessarily called Debbie Harry Rich. I think she was always being photographed by him. But I mean, they're kind of cool still, aren't they? These double images. Double images are always good. It's gives an interesting vibe to the whole thing. Uh, and I think these are weird paintings where you just got people to urinate onto like copper and that made those marks, which is a bit weird. And anyway, let's stroll on through here. This room is number 11 called Mortal Coil. As the 1980s progressed, Warhol's work featured more political and religious imagery, although it was deliberate. It reflected the concerns of the time, including the Cold War between the USR, US and the USSR and the escalating AIDS epidemic. He created such the images of the Statue of Liberty many times, didn't that? We've seen as the ultimate celebrity portrait. And then you've got Lenin over here. These ones are good. Especially like the one on the left where he's just sort of traced around his head. It's really cool. Oh, a freaky one. Hmm. Very nice. And then you got him himself. That sort of famous self-portrait of him. Black and red, that's good. 
very nice. And then down here you've got some of his wigs, which he would wear all the time. And then the last room is a huge um, Last Supper. Faith, Death and Desire come together in these 60 Last Suppers. It's large scale work. Formed as part of a series commissioned in 1986 based on Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. This famous mural depicts Jesus the night before his crucifixion with the 12 disciples. A copy of the mural had hung in the Warhol family kitchen. So a little close up on some of these. So I'm a bit like some of the other things where it's just changing slightly each time. But, um, yeah. Interesting, isn't it? It was. I mean, I guess it was a sort of. They don't seem to be fading away in any way, they just seem to be repeated more. Interesting whether it was just a repetition is the thing he was going for. Hard to tell. It was an interesting one to finish on. Just the black and white. Hmm. So, obviously, a Warhol cracking show, you don't want to miss it. Tate uh, Modern, probably on for quite a long time, but um, yeah, great show. Always good to see the things in real life. Um, and I suppose it's quite interesting, they had to get through his life quite quickly, but they managed to get, you know, quite a reasonable amount of quite interesting things into it. I don't know who she is, but she's obviously entertaining. Uh, um, yeah, so, cracking show. Make the most of it. Uh, as ever, do like and subscribe. Bomb buckler.